become spell weavers, reavers, rogues, and men at arms and answer the call of adventure. Pick up your sword, your axe, your spell book, your bow, your rule book, and your dice, and join the forces of good in their eternal fight against vile monsters, conspiring min maxers, horny bards, and blood soaked murder hobos. Discover the treasure trove of role playing games here on Rollin' Bones. My name is Ryan Howard, and I shall be your god. Good evening, Boneheads, and welcome back to Rolling Bones with Ryan Howard, where we are making old school young again. I'm your host and king of the Boneheads, Ryan Howard, and uh, tonight I am once again joined by uh, the author of The Living Campaign, a guide for creating and maintaining tabletop RPG campaigns, which you can find over on Amazon. I will post a link here in just a little bit. He has a great follow on Twitter, a guy who's always got a lot of insightful uh, commentary when you uh, follow him over on uh, our, our least favorite, favorite dumpster fire that is Twitter. Uh, he is, of course, Mr. John McGowan. So uh, I'll bring him on here in just a second. Before I do that, I want to remind everyone to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, we are growing fast here on Rolling Bones. I'm very excited uh, with the way things have been going this year. So, uh, you know, let's keep that momentum strong and uh, let's keep it rolling. And uh, that's the best way to do it is just to, you know, give me that little algorithmic bump. It's, it's great. It's greatly appreciated, and I'm so thankful for those of you who've done so already. Also want to remind everyone that you can find me on various social media platforms. On X and Instagram, I am at Howard underscore Ryan Gregg. YouTube is Rolling Bones. Twitch is twitch.tv slash Rolling Bones Ryan, and Substack is rollingbones.substack.com. I'll talk about Substack here in just a second. Uh, something I have not mentioned over the past couple weeks that, you know, just slipped my mind, haven't mentioned it. We're actually live on X right now. Uh, some of you are watching me on X right now, which, you know, is great. Uh, but that's another place where you can see Rolling Bones now is over on X. Uh, you know, it, it's great to, to be over there. My follower counts are pretty close on YouTube and X. So, you know, whichever whichever way you guys choose, I'm glad that you're tuning in. I'm glad you're watching. Uh, but that's an option for those of you out there who, uh, you know, watch the show live on Tuesdays. Also, uh, Substack, as I mentioned, that's where I post a lot of my thoughts on, uh, you know, role-playing games. I'm also going to be uh, posting a, a play report here tomorrow is, is when I'll be able to finish the article uh, because I restarted my Nighthaven campaign. So I will be... Uh, watching or not? Sorry, I, I'm playing on a regular basis. I'm now playing Axe again, so uh, I, you know, I'm looking forward to that. My my campaign is great. First session happened on Saturday, and so I'll be posting the play report for that uh, tomorrow. But you can find all of that over on uh, Substack, which is rollingbones.substack.com. Uh, let's say hi to some of the people that are here. Dunder Moose, uh, welcome. Always glad to have you on here. Malachi, you are uh, steadfast as always. Um, let's see if I pronounce this right. Scootifer Mike. Um, I'm, you know, I, I hope that you uh, enjoy this. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about you recently, so uh, you know, let's let's talk after after the fact, and then uh, we'll we'll see if we can work something out. Uh, Crafty Matt is going to be here for an hour, so uh, yeah, while that pork shoulder is in the oven and resting, I am glad that you will be joining us. Anyway, let's go ahead and bring on the guy that you are here to see. Once again, he is the author of The Living Campaign, a guide for creating and maintaining tabletop RPG campaigns. You can find it on Amazon. The link is here in chat. That is a long-ass link. <laughs> that, God, that, that took up like three chats there anyway ladies and gentlemen please welcome john mcgowan back to rolling bones john welcome back man hey thanks for having me ryan oh no problem at all thanks for coming on well, i'm glad to be back i'm kind of in the circuit again um so if you follow me on twitter you know that uh, i had a little bit of a career change 
Um, so now I'm kind of settled into the new job, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. How's that going so far? Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, this new new place treats me much better than old place. Um, so basically, uh, old place overstepped, and uh, I fired them. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yep. Okay. So the, it, it's always a good feeling when you when you leave a job on your own terms. Like the job search mm-hmm. sucks, but yeah, just that that feeling of I don't need you guys. You know, screw y'all. I'm, I'm going my own way. That like, you get that Breakfast Club fist in the air while "Don't You Forget <laughs> About Me" plays moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it definitely, it definitely was like that. They were sort of uh, taken. You know, it, it, I was basically asked to commute across state lines every day, and I was just like, "That's not. Yeah, it's just not going to work for me." So. <laughs> that, that wasn't in addition to across state lines. That wasn't across time zones too, was it? It was not. No, okay. it was it, it was uh, it was north. But yeah, it it was yeah, it just wasn't it wasn't going to work. Yeah. So I was fully remote before. I'm now I'm I'm in a hybrid position, but the the the, the company has a much healthier work culture. So uh, it's been it's much nicer. Good. Well, uh, anyway, uh, just not not to immediately dive into the the bad <laughs> news here, but you know to to start off our our news roundup as we've been doing here uh, on the show. Unfortunately, again, we don't have a ginger report. Uh, Don't blame me for that. Blame Harmony for not doing something interesting enough to get mentioned on the show. So (laughs) no ginger report. Um, However, speaking of females in the gaming space, uh, we do, (laughs) we do have some unfortunate news here. Uh, The, the Citadel has fallen. Mm. Uh, Warhammer 40k introduces female custodes mm-hmm. from uh, geeks and gamers here. Uh, so the the most recent uh, most recent source book for the uh, Adeptus Custodes is uh, adding in female custodes. Yes. Uh, yes. Very interesting. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's sort of expected at this point, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Games Workshop has been, as my understanding, has been uh, uh, somewhat embarrassed by a portion of its customer base for a, a going on a long time now. Going, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and you know, they're going to start sort of needling to see who you know who they can get to leave, and uh, yeah. you know, every 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 Citadel. Uh, you know, every everything that sort of matters to a certain subset of people, um, you know, they're not looking to sort of maintain those for them, unfortunately. Yeah, it it's one of those weird things about being in the tabletop space. In a lot of ways, I feel like this space is about five years behind the zeitgeist mm-hmm. on a lot of these issues. And so, yeah. like, this is something that companies were doing in 2017, 2018, 2019, as far as, like, you know, movies that were, uh, you know, recasting characters to, to you know, fit various DEI checkboxes um, to see, you know, comics replacing uh beloved characters with again uh you know diversity hires this is something that was happening a long time ago and yeah. like just now it's hitting warhammer 40k yeah um which i mean like the i mean we should be happy it sort of lasted as long as it did um in, in the environment uh i am sort of in the camp of you know when I, you know, a lot of people are trying to rationalize this. They try to make it make sense, you know, and I, I kind of see, I see a lot of people going like, well, it doesn't make sense in the lore. I'm like, this has nothing to do with the lore. Like, you don't need to be like, if you're spitting out lore arguments to something that they've been wanting to do to you anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's not like, you're not like, this is your problem is with reality and yeah. reality being imposed, basically kind of breaking containment on a self-contained Kind of setting with this, and like it's the, the the fiction is not consistent with itself, and that's the part that sucks, right? Um, 
and it it not being consistent with itself while also being like the parts that are being twisted are the parts specifically to just sort of uh do things that intentionally irritate the portion of their customer base that they don't like that they are embarrassed by like there's no there's really no rhyme or reason to it like there's like oh you know we're gonna they're gonna lose sales it's like they don't care you know the it, Getting the ESG scores, the loans, that's not the point. The point is, you know, we're going to, um, with these are, we're going to get extra money. The money is subsidizing our ability to uh, openly dislike you. Yep. You know, these are things we want to do anyway, and we're just, now we get paid for it. This is great. Like, mm. this. So, yeah. It, and, and this is the thing, like, wh when I did my, my stream talking about, you know, the, the decline and inevitable death of Wizards of the Coast. Sure. Um, this is something that I, I've talked about before. You can't rely on these properties to last forever. Mm -mm. No one out there is listening to this on their RCA radio. No one is right. listening to this while driving their uh, their Bantam or their Studebaker right now. Mm -hmm. Things fall apart and decay. And mm -hmm. like this is just the inevitability of you know, all of this. this. Everything in the grand scheme of things that we love is new. Games Workshop is maybe 40 years old, probably less than 40. Um, at some point, even Games Workshop is going to just disappear. So right. instead of like the, the people who are now in control of it, they don't want to like they don't want to take your lover from you. That's not what's going on here. <laughs> they want to sacrifice your lover on an altar and then reanimate their corpse. Yeah. And like have that be a part of their macabre ritual. That's that's what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. And and so you you have to accept that everything you love will at some point pass away and die. And if you truly love something like Warhammer 40K, especially if you're in my shoes or even if you're you know younger than me, guys who are in their early 20s or late teens, you see what they're doing to this thing that you loved. Use your passion for this thing to make the next thing. That's what we should be concentrating our energy on. Of course, they're going to do this. Of course, this is, you know, the, the course of action that they decide to take. So why not just say, all right, if you want to kill it, kill it. We will, uh, you know, we, we'll carry forth its memory and build something even grander. Yeah. Well, and, okay. And this is, you know, I've thought about this a lot and I, you know, the, the the age of like ubiquity is over like the shared cultural value like went like for the shared cultural kind of entertainment phenomenon went away with season eight of game of thrones yeah you know that was the last time you know that we all kind of got together um you know the future especially like for people in these spaces the future is dubs are on okay it's muppets yeah. all the way down <laughs> and and uh or like or in like you know the future is like my very like uh stringently historically accurate <laughs> fantasy campaign you know like it's it's going to be is like these little things like we're gonna start returning a little bit to like the campfire tales you know talking about the kingdom of prester john that you know that's out there uh this like secret african christian kingdom yeah. you know uh, and it's just it's going to be one of those things where like everybody's the stories that we're going to tell is going to be a lot more siloed it's going to be i i think it's going to be like more more like archipelagos mm -hmm. um and you're going to have these and i think that's kind of ultimately going to be a good thing because the people who are in those communities are going to be like very very tight knit yeah. And what is the point of this? If like, what is the point of a franchise that I have to basically go to war to protect like every day of my life? Mm -hmm. Like, or feel the need to, I should like, I actually can't protect it as a consumer. I have no, I'm not on the board, but like, I feel this, like, but I do feel this, you know, I've got shelves, sh shelves and shelves of Warhammer fiction, you know, 
<laughs> and mm. I was like, I wake up one day and I, I realize that like the company that I purchased these from like doesn't doesn't really like me that much, you know. And they they hide it under a veil of plausible deniability. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I, that's kind of what I'm looking at. As like I see it as like we're going to be start. It's going to be a start like a lot being more, a lot more regional, a lot more sort of group specific. Mm. Um, and I think that's fine. I think that's, that's great. Yeah, and even like. Let's be let's be frank. There's a lot of guys out here who um, are are right wingers who love Warhammer 40k. Like that, yeah. that that's a meme for a reason. Yep. But what you have to realize is Warhammer 40k, like by authorial intention, was never meant to be right wing. They just didn't understand what they were satirizing and accidentally created something that was beautifully and inherently right wing. Yeah, yeah, mega based, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 the the time old story of accidental baseness. It's the same thing you get in like when you read Judge Dread, right? Like the the people who write Judge Dread have like they don't know that they think Judge Dread's the villain of his own story when in reality, no, not even close. No, uh, and and I think you know I think they were probably better at it. Um, you know, years and years ago, like, I'm not sure, you know, 20, it was like even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I, I'm not sure that like the, the people kind of running it now have the, the requisite subtlety, you know, or the requisite, like, like self-seriousness. Like I, I mm. think they probably were a little more self-serious back then. Like that, you know, of course yeah. they're, you know, they're libs, you know, and they're kind of always like kind of of a certain stripe, but I don't think, um, you know, I think they were, I think straight up, they were just more talented back then. Yeah. Um, you know, but full stop. And I just, I think they're both uh, kind of ideologically captured um, as well as uh, incompetent. And I think, I think that's a very strange combination. And maybe, or, you know, and maybe if they are smart, like I think it probably is more, I think the bitterness sort of outweighs that. They, they, they're very bitter kind of, I was going to say toward certain people, but I think kind of very generally as well. Yeah. And to, to answer some of the, the chats that we're getting here, uh, Orcus Dorcas, uh, Games Workshop is bona fide establishment. They aren't going anywhere, but whatever it is they will become in the future will be unrecognizable from what it is. I mean, that's this is the, the path of D&D. &D. This is the path of mm -hmm. all of these kind of establishment uh, lifestyle brands that uh gaming and nerd culture have taken on the thing itself is dead it's the it you know it's being weekend at bernie's around uh, so that uh you know people can pretend it's still alive it, it's this kind of macabre ceremony of watching the thing that you love's body being paraded around as if it was still real i i go back to uh there's this country song. Uh, John, are you are you very familiar with country music? Um, yeah, I you know I'm actually located in the south, so probably by osmosis. <laughs> are you familiar with the Joe Diffie song "Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox If I Die"? I'm not. <laughs> so the the premise of the song is basically just a, a guy who likes to party saying, "If I die tonight, you you prop me up beside the jukebox, put a beer in my hand, and." like keep the party going. But the video for the song is just it's it's weakened at Bernie's, but in a honky tonk. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. <laughs> and so like w when I think about what companies are doing to these IPs now, I think about that video. That's it died cool. somewhere along the way, but they're just going to pretend like it didn't. They're just going to keep it going. Yeah, well, it's just now it's starting to smell. And that's kind of yeah. what this is, because it's not you know, it's like if you take it in its like kind of its requisite parts, you're not exactly, you know, it's very easy for them when you get kind of annoyed by this. And if you're not really have, having thought about it, um, to for them to point and to just kind of run with your irritation and be like, oh, so you hate women. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, well, no, it, what I hate is, is like kind of the imposition of your like your weird little like hang ups. Because yeah. like, I'm when you do this thing 
I'm kind of reminded that, you know, the, the, the world outside of this exists and it has an opinion on, mm -hmm. on the thing, on these things. Um, so. Gotcha. So yeah, Warhammer 40k, they, they finally, they finally did it. They finally, uh, flipped the switch. They, they sought Canadian healthcare and now they are. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, I would just say, like, I know a lot of people are very upset because, like, they rightfully are interpreting things as as being sort of targeted at them. And, yep. um, I, you know, I would just sort of tell people, like, look, you know, this is, um, you know, corporate. It's probably good that, you know, we feel like we can kind of get a, to a point where we feel like we could step away from, you know, the corporate slop yep um and you know as awesome and based as 440k could be you know at the end of the day it you know they have it they have a stock ticker yeah you know and and now like you are i i'm having way more fun with my kind of like my homegrown kind of uh like living campaign um than i ever did with any corporate ip so like, yeah. that's kind of the thing I enjoy now. And I'm closer with my friends than ever. I have, and I've, I've been adding more people to that group. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I like, that's real. Okay. Spending a, a ton of money. Like I, we can, we can do war stuff. We like, we could play war games all we want and spending a ton of money to go and play in a tournament for people that like, don't like me very much. Like, I don't see the point of that. Right. Yep. The, the the last thing to say about this is um, I, I am preparing myself for the inevitability that, you know, when when basically the mainstream Warhammer 40K ambassador Henry Cavill finally has to comment on this, he's mm. just going to say, you know, it's good that we're branching out. I'm preparing for him to give the stock answer. Yeah. A small part of me is hoping that Henry Cavill is just going to be like, nah, nah, man, shit's gay. And, <laughs> and yeah, then, I don't know. If he does that, if he's like, no, this is stupid, why would you do this? Like, <laughs> well, he got himself, uh, uh, you know, he got himself um, asked politely to leave off The Witcher. So <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> who knows? So uh, moving on from there, one of the one of the topics that you wanted to discuss um, about, you know, some of the things that I've talked about here recently and some of the uh, some of the topics that have been kind of you know popping up in our circles. Um, of course, you know, it, the most recent update from MCDM is still kind of alive in the discourse right now. And you had some thoughts about that Um so, so, you know, go ahead and kind of, kind of share what you were, you were thinking or what you wanted to, to say about that particular side of things. Of course, uh, you know, for those of you who are just now tuning in, we're talking about the, uh, the power roll video that Matt Colville posted and the community reaction to, uh, you know, some of these updates coming out of the, the Matt Colville camp right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, so Matt, like, Matt Colville is definitely trying to cultivate an audience and he's doing, you know, which frankly I, I find somewhat refreshing um, in that he either, he does have like a targeted direction he wants to go um, as opposed to just sort of blanket trying to get as many people as he can and then rug pulling the ones he doesn't want. Mm -hmm. um, you, like, you, you, you know what you're getting. Well, I, I, I would say that you have like, uh, you know who you are if you're kind of interested in this. Yeah. And, you know, that's fine. I kind of view this as somewhat beside the point. So, like, when you look at MCDM, it is a marketing strategy with kind of like a game dressing around it. Um, and which, you know, is probably a little dismissive to the people working on it, but, but that's fine. Um, they don't know me. And um, <clears throat> what... 
they're, that's what they're doing. They're kind of doing like they're building a product and they're going to try to sell this product to like a customer base. And we're like any like if I don't see how that it overlaps with us at all because we're we're trying basically create these games like uh, it seems like what we're trying to do over here is sort of create the reemergence of the 70s game club yeah and mcdm is like never going to be that one dnd is never going to be that and as far as things like i'm interested in and the things that i would want to watch very closely for kind of s trying to subvert they would also be trying to do that but twisting it like that's the things you want to watch for mcdm is going to be its own thing it's in its own orbit like i barely even would classify it as a hobby like it's a hobby in the same way you know like a game like like i don't know like playing video games by yourself is a hobby it's like yeah. I, don't, I don't like hobbies are something generally you do and you share with people mm -hmm. so and like i don't really know how many campaigns are going to kind of emerge from these things uh because it, it seems to be they're always either very small to or they just never get off the ground at all. And it seems mm -hmm. like we're playing a lot, but. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what people don't realize is we're playing for long periods of time. Well, I say we. The, I, I am finding myself in a situation where I just restarted a campaign. Um, so I, I am still finding my feet uh, as I'm incorporating these ideas into my table. Um, just to put all my cards on the table there, but you're onto something there. The, the people in our camp, the, the bros or, you know, even the, the people who are just kind of around the bros, um, you know, pe people like in basic experts community or, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. We're playing for longer periods of time with the same people we're you know we're creating these worlds as we go rather than playing in a world that's already been created where all the cool stuff has already been done right like every session is a new discovery every session is a new chance for adventure that takes you in a completely different direction than the one you were already on this is something that when you play according to the Colville model, or when you play according to the one D&D model, you absolutely cannot recreate. No, no. And, and, and for that reason, I don't really view it as a threat, mm -hmm. you know, because nobody like anybody who's sort of coming over my house to, to play in my AD&D campaign is not really sitting there trying to like steer me on the MCDM. What they're doing is they're coming to my campaign and they're getting involved and they're building a bunch of characters and they, they become kind of like a permanent fixture, you know? Um, and even if they have to step away from the campaign for a bit, they're still sort of a part of the campaign. Like they're still involved with the group chats. I found yeah. out, I found out some of my players go golfing on the weekends together. Now they did not know each other before my campaign, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? And, you know, when I first was like trying to get my job switched, you know, who's the first people that started offering me, um, you know, like, trying to, hey, send me your resume. I bet I can kind of like finagle you into something here. Like, these are the first people that were going to bat for me. Like, this is a very tight knit group and we didn't start that way. And that's the kind of campaigns that like I advocate for. Like, so yeah. when I see people getting really like, so when MC, like when Matt Govill wants to get rid of the power roll, okay, like, cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I that's like it's like it's you can call it tabletop rpgs but like it's it, it's something else at that point like i'm yeah i'm sorry like, there's like i'm not even we're not even the same genre we're not on the same planet mm -hmm. and and part of what's driving that in my opinion and and i believe this to be absolutely correct especially after the recent developments and the, the most recent video both matt colville and Wizards of the Coast are developing a digital first experience. They mm -hmm. want you to play online using their proprietary VTTs with your friends and be a part of their ecosystem. They're building a video game in all but name. Right. We are not doing that at all. We're building real life communities, tight knit with, mm -hmm. you know, people who not just, you know, come together and play a game once a week, twice a week, however frequently you play, but, you know, are, are connected with each other in a meaningful way. You know, we're, we're kind of looking at bowling alone and going, we don't want to live like that anymore. Uh, we're, we're pushing into 
what used to be. We're trying to bring back that that club mentality. And mm-hmm. so I, I think you're right that we are at this point building two different uh, parallel ecosystems. And I think one of them is a lot stronger than the other, a lot more sustainable over time. Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 a it's a very driven by so like the kind of getting into like the one D and D like it's very driven by like money and prestige, um, which you know almost a lot of things are you know and you have to to some extent like you can't be like debase like you can't do things that debase yourself you know so it's like you do need to have like somewhat prestige is 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 isn't a, a component, um, <clears throat> but. I th- I think this sort of like driving force of like economic primacy is is that's not I don't think that's what we're doing at all. Um, right. I think there, there probably is like there's definitely an interest in making money, and I think that's like normal and fine. And there's probably going to be some people that try to get in and you know turn it into like a business model, which is also normal and fine. You're not going to have everybody who's sort of like a quote unquote true believer, but I think. I, I think the, the ecosystem that we're trying to build is definitely more is less inclined to sort of to, to develop into a business model. Like it's like, it's almost, it's like, it's not interested in money. Mm-hmm. Um, um, kind of as a primary thing, money would be nice, but it's not like the driving force of everything I'm doing, yeah. you know? Um, so obviously like I need it to work, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like that's, I look at that. <clears throat> Yeah, I, and I, and I think that's sort of like the big the big difference is that they're just like so completely hooked into the, the like the economic model that they're not really thinking about anything else. Yeah, and and to to your point there, um, to to bring to bring a wrestling analogy into this, uh, Please. legendary wrestling manager Jim Cornette has the saying of, "Are you selling the sizzle or the steak?" Mm. our community is mostly selling the steak and maybe we need a little bit more sizzle in there. Maybe we need some kind of big splashy show off moment so that people can really, you know, like get a glimpse of our power. But on the other side, you've got MCDM, you've got one D and D and all they have is sizzle. All they have is, sound and fury and showmanship and you know here's these highly produced videos here's you know the this completely curated experience but when you actually sit down to to bite into that sizzling steak it's not there there's nothing there they they don't even put a steak in front of you so yeah well and you know this might be like completely off the mark but my I'm, i'm sort of reminded of um you know, Thomas Carlyle, he goes on about sham Kings. Yeah. And, um, I, I sort of like, there's, there's definitely like kind of an energy there that I think they're tad, like the sham King energy where it's like, these people are at the top of their game and, but they're just not interested in being completely driven or being kind of turned by the forces around them instead of being the ones who are like being the taste makers. Yeah. You know, um, which I think, which I think, you know, say what you will, like we, you know, we lack resources, but I think at least in here in this sphere is like, we're trying to be tastemakers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, even the attempt at that, I, I think is probably ultimately in the long term, like, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's Rocky and Apollo Creed. You've got someone who is taking this very seriously. Uh, you know, we're, we're scrappy, we're underdogs, but we're fighting and we're, we're taking it very seriously. And then you've got the guy at the top who thinks it's a show. And mm-hmm. at some point they're going to have this moment like Apollo had in the corner with Tony. Those of you who are Rocky fans, uh, where, where Tony, his trainer says he doesn't know this is a show. He thinks it's a damn fight. That's what we're going to have in this community at some point. So <laughs> Yeah, I think that I think that's accurate. Um, you know, I mean, I don't I don't think it's an accident that like, you know, the um, kind of the, the the big the bigger names here are like essentially anons. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean that's that's what we're dealing with here. That's uh, 
you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, these kind of smaller, scrappier upstart communities uh, on, on our side. You know, we're, we're building um, it, we're, we're building our hobbies. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like Calvin Oni here in chat says, we don't need monoliths to have our hobby. We can we can still play without these, you know, titans standing over us. M you know, many people played before any of this was cool and, you know, we'll be playing long after it has, you know, passed into uncoolness again. Yeah, God willing. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm always reminded of, um, so there's a, a it, it not always, but um, it's remi it reminds me of something I recently read. I was reading a book on the Middle Ages, mm. and uh, and it was sort of talking about how some of the uh, like like towns and villages were so insular that they had developed uh, independent dialects like ten miles from each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, uh, and it was sort of presenting that as like, yeah, look, see how like how negative that is. Um, I don't know, like. That seems like it might be like seems like the people within those communities were probably <laughs> they probably had a very clear idea of what was going on. Um, yeah. So, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, it's probably I don't think it's insane to think that something similar might end up happening here. Um, yeah. So, yeah. which is great for keeping people out that uh, don't don't like you. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to, to speak to some of what uh, people are saying here in chat, uh, Space King of Space, I long for the day it becomes uncool again. I mean, like, that's what we're dealing with here in in all of nerd culture is our ideas have completely run the spectrum at this point. They've gone from being, uh, you know, fringe and edgy to being adopted by some, uh, you know, kind of early adopters who are okay with a little bit of edginess and then they've sanded off some of the edges, brought it into more and more acceptable spaces. And, you know, just as it kind of travels down this pipeline of becoming more and more socially acceptable, everything that makes it cool, edgy, interesting is gradually filed off until it just becomes the same homogenized, processed, packaged gray goop that everything else eventually becomes. And then, at that point, it's interesting to no one, and it's discarded. So, yeah, you know, we're we're just waiting for people to to throw this aside so that we can kind of have our spaces back again. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not. Um, <clears throat> I think that like that is getting going to be getting increasingly harder to do because the the culture has become so fragmented. Kind of the broader, like the actual like broader culture has become so fragmented and. Uh, turned like a kaleidoscope of like little communities that all sort of distrust each other. Um, the, you, you can't like, it's, you you get to the point to where sort of like the next, like, I don't like, what is going to be the next big thing? Cause it seems like a lot of things, a lot of big things are dying and we're being replaced by nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I, like you, like you were saying, the the next big thing implies that there's some kind of uh, some kind of uh, cultural uh, homogeneity, and that like it just doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not around. Yeah. No. And and like good and good riddance. Um, yeah. You know, uh, humanity started by you know with campfire stories, and you know th that's where we'll return. And like, and I think that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's probably healthier. Like, are we really supposed to share kind of a space with like hundreds of thousands, of millions of people? Like, does that? I don't know. It it seems like it seems to make the people who are kind of steering that um, miserable and or psychotic. Um. So, like, I I don't know. I'd rather kind of prefer I prefer to sort of be in a much more manageable community of people whose names and faces I know. Um, but maybe that's mm -hmm. just me. Yeah. So uh, speaking of our kind of edgy outsider spaces and maybe how they're they're influencing people who are closer to the center, uh, let, let's I, we're not going to play this video. I've, I've done uh, too many video reactions recently, so we're we're, we're <laughs> not going to actually watch this tonight. But I want to I want to show you all something. I want to <laughs> want you to, to have a gander at this. Uh, so you guys are all familiar with uh, one 
Ben Milton, aka Questing Beast. Um, he's one of the more influential voices in uh, what has been wrought upon what was once the OSR. And uh, just today, he released a video called The Man Who Accidentally Invented Role-Playing Games. Um, basically, just going over the story of David Wesley and the Bronstein and... Uh, you know, the the days before Arneson and Gygax and Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and uh, to to harken back to something I said on uh, diversity in dragons, I, I just have this uh, loop in my head of that uh, that song by Styx from the album Kilroy was here. Haven't we been here before? <laughs> yeah um hey you know um i figure it, like that's how you know your idea is catching fire right is you get a qb yep. video mm -hmm. and you know rightfully so um you know rightfully so jeffro johnson was very upset about this <laughs> <laughs> Like, you can understand why. Jeffro's mm -hmm. been talking about this for years. Um, yeah. And even even beyond just Jeffro, um, like, there's a whole documentary called Secrets of Blackmore. Don't know if you saw it. I've never heard of it. <laughs> um, just, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, in Jeffro's case, I extremely sympathetic because uh i mean he's been shouting this he's been banging this drum forever mm -hmm. and uh you know it's like yeah i get i get the guys like pugilistic but um you know credit where credit is due <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you can't say he hasn't been passionate about this like these particular things like come on mm -hmm. but you know he's done this before this is not the first time that questing beast has reached into uh you know kind of the the discourse around uh you know our circles and just kind of like been like okay let me take this idea as my own um you know let let me pretend like i came up with this or let me pretend like this was my epiphany he he does this all the time mm -hmm. um he did this with one-to-one -one time he you know he he's done this over and over again mm -hmm. and the sorry i don't uh, go ahead i didn't mean to interrupt you no i you can go ahead um yeah so he like he's interesting because it, it's not because i don't think he's like all that interested in some of these ideas either um so but he knows that they get some they get some traffic or at mm -hmm. least like they're interesting. Like he, you know, he's gotten pretty good at, I think probably predicting something that's going to be algorithmically beneficial to him. And like, so like one-to-one -one time. So the thing with him, like what he's doing is, yeah, he's, he's like taking from it. He's popularizing it, but he's like giving no details, like right. how to do it, what it means, what it, so it's like, so it, like, it's almost like, it's almost like a hype man video. Like, it, like I, um, I, like, I remember watching it a, a while ago and it basically funneled me directly to here um because it was like well that tells me nothing and then you try to read the dmg and the dmg is just like somewhat opaque in, <laughs> in its prose and uh and you're sort of forced to kind of go like look for like well i guess there's got to be some community who's using this and then and here mm -hmm. we are so i i you know it is insulting don't get me wrong like it said like it, it sucks and but at the same time, like the way he goes about it is in such a way that it like gives the people that are interested. He hypes it up. The people are get interested. They don't know how to do it. And then they have to learn. And that's how they end up here. Yep. Yeah. And and this this kind of goes back to the uh, the idea that I brought up about ideas kind of going through these stages where they start in the fringes and then are gradually made more and more acceptable as, you know, like edges are sanded off. Sure. That's. That's all that Questing Beast is doing right now. He's finding these ideas that are presented by people like uh, Jeffro or B-dubs 
or, you know, hell, Macho Mandolf is right here in chat, uh, like he always is. And and once again, Macho Mandolf, thank you for, uh, you know, for, for supporting us here. Um, yeah, man. You see these people talking about these ideas, but they talk about them in uh, kind of this code language or, you know, kayfabe, as they as they like to say to, again, you know, bring bring in bring wrestling into it. <laughs> and all all Ben is doing is kind of, you know, plucking these ideas out of their discourse and dusting off all the kayfabe, dusting off all the various personalities uh, you know, he's not suggesting that you use Muppets in your game, for example, and then presenting them as his own idea. And on one hand, yes, there's this positive aspect of people are are hearing these ideas. They're hearing them from someone that they trust and are then, you know, seeking out more information and maybe eventually finding uh finding Jeffro or finding B dubs or, or even just, you know, reading the AD and D dungeon masters guide for the first time in its entirety. But at the same time, you also have this guy treating people with, uh, actual, you know, intellectual rigor who are actually doing work and, and actually thinking about these ideas in depth. He's, he's treating us like a farm system. He's just sure. coming in and, once the ideas are uh, presentable at a certain point, he's just kind of like picking them up and go, that's mine now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess like for me, I, I would look at it in terms of, you know, if I had to put it like basically in friend enemy terms, um, is this person making it harder for me to operate? And, I guess, you know, or, or like, or the bros, like the bros are to, to operate. And I just don't, mm. I just don't see, like, I don't see QB sort of smashing or like kind of suppressing that community because frankly, like, I don't think they can be suppressed. Mm. And, <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, but I mean, I don't think he's even like even really trying. So it's really sort of just sort of like a, a, like a, a parasitic arrangement. Yeah. Um, like maybe there's some like robbing of momentum, I guess. Like I, I it's it's like it's hard to say. It's not somebody who's like basically in open war, you know, um, mm -hmm. like certain other people. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> uh, that's that's a, that's a very I think, you know, I think I find that to be like actually dangerous, especially with, you know, accusations that get lobbied around very casually. Um, so being, I don't know, like I said, maybe I, I may, maybe I'm too tolerant of perhaps slimy behavior, but mm. uh, I'd rather, I'd rather deal with slimy than getting like grenades lobbed at me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I had to pick one, <sighs> we've got some people kind of expressing similar uh, sentiments here in chat. Uh, just to to give credit where it's due, uh, you know, Crafty Matt uh, says that uh, QB is an anchor man. He takes big stories and dumps them down for the masses. I, yeah, yeah, I'm basically yeah. Um, that that's a good way to put it. And then I said a lot of words to get there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Crafty. And that's that's the magic of Crafty. You know. Uh -oh. And then I'm, I'm trying to find, oh, here, R-Dubs has a good point here as well. Uh, this isn't popular, but this is a normal cycle of information dispersal. The, uh, yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's what happens. The, yeah. If you look at the, the, the popular one that everyone always uses, uh, it, you know, punk rock. Um, some of the OGs of punk were the popularizers like, you know, the Ramones, the Sex Pistols. But you, you know, the you've got these relatively edgy outsider bands and then you've got bands that come in like uh, Green Day or uh, Blink-182 and they kind of clean up punk a little bit and present it in a way that is uh, acceptable to your TRL audience. And... Mm -hmm that's it's just what happens when something catches on it's it's 
you know, the way of things. You, you can't hold on to these ideas forever and keep them pure unless you're willing to accept that other people are going to adulterate your ideas and, uh, you know, you know the truth. If you're comfortable, just like Flannery O'Connor said, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. If you're comfortable with that, it's okay and you can you can cope with it. But if you're not, you're going to have a bad time. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, if, you know, the re if you're like a real radical about these sorts of things, chances are like you are going to eventually sort of acquire an audience. And as you get more pop, like as you get more popularized, you're going to start running into the problem of the audience, uh, kind of the lowest common denominator of your thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the what you get for popularity is a lot more people uh, you get, like you have to deal with like a higher percentage of idiots. Yeah. Like that, that's the, that's the reward for popularity, you know? So, which also sort of makes sense. Like when you're sort of dealing with this thing and then you're having to like, once it starts to like balloon out of control, you're having to deal with like this um, uh, sort of infusion of, of, of people, you know, that you can't, they, they they don't really get it um and it just sort of makes sense that like following from that like they they're not your your thing is going to start kind of decaying at that point yeah um and then it makes way for like kind of the new thing it's like it's the this like kind of the circle of life with, with the way these things go you know i fully plan on in 15 years becoming like uh completely out of touch and getting you know displaced by somebody else <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. you know god willing longer i'm gonna be like you know it's gonna be 20 years 30 years uh, but mm -hmm. it, eventually it's gonna happen like as plugged in as i feel right now eventually I, I won't be and that's and that's fine yep i in in the immortal words of abe simpson i was with it once and then it changed <laughs> and it'll happen to you <laughs> yes exactly exactly so and i think that's just what you know watsy's dealing with is like they're sort of terminally out of touch so and games workshop for that matter so yeah. and you know for, for as much as we talk about you know questing beast being an, an acceptable uh source for a lot of people's information you you look at his actions versus you know the, the way that the bro sr acts yeah the bro sr is abrasive on twitter but mm -hmm. uh, we've got someone here in chat brother grognard who was kicked out of uh the discord server and uh the nave two kickstarter because he was raising questions about questing beast printing copies of his deluxe edition uh nave two and bringing them to gary con before backers actually got them so yeah on one hand jeffro and b dubs and uh crossface and whoever can be spicy on twitter but on the other hand you've got a guy who's uh, stabbing his Kickstarter backers in the back and then silencing all dissent. Yeah, well, and, um, you know, Jeff Rowe and uh, B-Dubs' blogs are free. Yeah. You know, and uh, and that's also kind of segues. Is all of my kind of Substack stuff is always going to be free as far as advice goes. The only thing I'm ever going to put behind paid posts is fiction. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, like because like I'm passionate about this hobby. They're passionate about this hobby. So it's sort of, um, that's what I'm talking about, like not being interested in kind of the economic side. So like Jeff has his book, but the, most of his content's free. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Got to keep the lights on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm saying this as someone who also has a Kickstarter adventure out there that I'm working on and, and going to deliver or. <sighs> mm -hmm. I. I... I hesitate because I I don't want people to think that I don't have this thing written. I do. It's just mm -hmm. I start I know the second I start talking crap about someone doing something underhanded or crappy with uh with their kickstarters immediately uh, I'm going to run into some kind of issue where it looks like I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to run into some kind of complication. So I I find that just like kind of boldly owning whatever it is that you've done, you know, and whether it be like, you know, you're just explaining yourself, 
yeah. you know, or whatever. Um, not apologizing, just being like, this is what I did. All right. You can be mad about it, but this is what I did. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely one thing I, you know, the, it's the underhanded side of things where it's like, actually, we're not going to talk about it and I'm just going to delete you from the campaign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. like, that's the part I think this is mm -hmm. kind of the real sin. Um, but like, if I did that, if I printed, you know, if I got to, got to, had, I would probably just own it. I'd be like, yeah, like Gary Con comes once a year. I didn't want to wait a whole year. Sorry guys. Yep. So and Calvinoni in chat here is telling me not to jinx myself. Cal, you're one of my backers. So. <laughs> oh, the, the shareholders are in the audience. Oh, my yep. goodness. I, yeah, I, the, the <laughs> shareholders are right here. Oh, all right. Well, a lot of these people have a lot of money tied up in, in uh, <laughs> Guts and Glory Volume 1. So, Heck, yeah. But, yeah, I mean... That that's really the the long and short of of that drama. It, on one hand, you hate to see it be someone like Questing Beast, who's who's been such a a shit heel recently. Um, but on the other hand, it's inevitable that it's going to be someone. Uh, you know, hopefully, it's some even you know at you know by the same token, Harmony Ginger is also talking about these ideas. She mm -hmm. is crediting the the bros who explain them to her but she's also participating in this process of disseminating the information to people who are not willing to put up with the edginess of the bros mm -hmm. and i think she's doing it in better faith than questing beast is because he's just stealing she's trying to explain how she's using them at her table but at some point it was going to happen. It's just a matter of how are we going to go about this? How are we going to make sure that, you know, the people who did the work on this are getting the credit they deserve. It, you know, it's a matter of um, just being classy with it, I think is what it comes down to. Yeah. It's fashion. Okay. Things like this comes to fashion. It's like this is the, you know, we're in the fashion show stage before everything looks really weird you know, and it's going to get disseminated. And that's, it just means, you know, the people who are adopting it now and who are at the top and are participating, you know, they're just at the tip of the spear, you know, they're like saying, um, you know, uh, basically people who want to kind of like sit around and like people who are working together in this community are the ones who like that, that, that just means they're sort of like the elite of this. People mm -hmm. start aping them when somebody can like yell at you and get mad at you, blah, 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 whatever. If they start aping you, that means you're in charge. Right. So yeah. like, it's like, it, like that's kind of the, the long and short of it. That's why like, if somebody wants to copy me, if somebody wants to rip me off, that means I'm in control. That means I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. And that means they're copying me. Okay. They're lower status than me. And yeah. not to put, not to be like too, not to say I'm having like an ego trip over here, but like, if you want to get down on the nuts, like the political nuts and bolts of what is happening, they are kind of acknowledging that by doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of, yeah, that like that has a, that takes on a life of its own. So, cause like always sort of being on the back foot, if you're the guy plagiarizing, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. So as we're kind of coming towards the end of our time here, are there any other topics that you wanted to discuss or, uh, you know, any, anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, I kind of think I was like, you know, I shilled for, um, um, like my idea with, uh, trying to just, you know, we're trying to form game clubs and go out there and form game. Like you form your campaigns guys, uh, with the idea that you are going to get, create a club of close knit friends who are going to support each other. And then mm -hmm. add people, find ways to add people, and maybe even get more games going, find a way to do it. Because um, I think, you know, getting together, even if you got to do it over the internet, it's suboptimal. But if you could do it in real life, especially, do it. You know, um, there's always a way to make it work. So, yeah. But that's kind of, I guess that'd be my final thought. That'd be what I like to like leave it off on. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So uh, once again, I want to remind everyone that you can get uh, John's book, 
The Living Campaign, a guide for creating and man maintaining tabletop RPG campaigns on Amazon. Here is a shorter link that will be popping up in chat, one that does not take up four messages each. Hmm. Um, so, and, and you guys will find it linked in uh, the pinned comment below this, uh, this replay as well. Uh, for those of you who are watching after the fact, um, John, thank you so much for coming on again. I, I think we've had some, some great discussions tonight. Um, I also want to remind everyone, if you are buying this book and you are reading it, um, leave a, leave a review for John. It, it's one of these things that helps independent creators like us out. If you enjoy what you're reading, leave that review to let people know that, that you got something out of it. If you don't enjoy it, also leave a review Mm -hmm. let us know what constructive feedback you have. It, like it's, it's the most important thing we can have as independent creators to know one that people are enjoying it, but two, what people want to see more of, want to see less of how they uh, suggest we go about improving as we continue as creators. Mega Blizzard man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah. And Patty's parlor. That's uh, that is commendable. Alternative sites are always needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I... Alternative sites. Like at this point, we, we do need alternatives. We need, we, you know, we need our alternatives to Amazon. We need our drive through alternative. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a matter of people need to build tools that are usable and need to not do things that turn off major creators that can, you know, point other people towards using your platforms. And I think you all know who I'm talking about when I, when I say that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah. I had a thought, but it, uh, I lost the plot. Cool. So, uh, Cal here in chat, uh, wants to know what the book is. Uh, so ah. once, once again, Cal, it is the living campaign, a guide for creating and maintaining tabletop RPG campaigns. Uh, and John, do you want to just give a quick rundown to anyone who, uh, is not familiar with the book already, what they will be getting sure. when they pick this thing up? Yeah, um, so it's basically a um, kind of, you know, it's, in, it's a two-part book, 150 pages, you know, um, pretty readable. Uh, the cover is very nice, so even if you don't like it, it'll look good on your shelf, promise. Um, and so part one is basically trying to uh, kind of step-by-step -step set up a campaign. And I try to distill it to the sort of the points that matter as far as like longevity and getting people together and being sort of insulated from scheduling conflicts and that sort of thing. Um, to name kind of the, my, the, uh, the big thing is scheduling conflicts kill campaigns. And that that's, you know, I think you, if you run a game, kind of what I'm talking about, uh, the way I kind of talk about, um, you're not really going to have that problem too much. Yeah. Um, and then part two is sort of a logical defense of why, like it's why I tell you to do the things I, I say in part one. So if you're sort of bought in, you don't really need to read part two. Um, but I think it's good. I think it's still good to read the second half just so you can kind of like understand sort of the spirit of it as well, because then when you run into things that are outside of kind of the scope, you'll be able to sort of, uh, be, you'll be trained on kind of what to look for um, and like one of what's important. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, and that's sort of what it is, is a, just a, it's a guide to creating a, a, a reactive sandbox tabletop campaign. Yep. Yeah. And, and just to kind of give people, you know, th this is something I've been thinking a lot about um, just to kind of, you know, leave people with a, a last point of discussion and, you know, just to give us a few more minutes to, to talk here. Um, one of the biggest things with a sandbox campaign is the game should always be available. The players might not always be available. 
but the game is available. And so what that means is you as the referee are available. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's every week, every other week, twice a week, whatever your frequency say there will be a game who can make it. And then you run with whoever's there, whether it is six people or two people, or, you know, maybe even just one person can make it. There's a game. We're going to do something. Um, and then the people who show up, show up, they get to advance their characters. They get to participate. They get to affect the campaign world. And the people who don't show up as frequently or who don't make it a priority, they either realize, hey, I need to make this a priority if I want to be at the same level as everyone else, or they drop. And mm -hmm. it, you, you very much have to... As the game master, you are taking on the responsibility of I will be here at this time more often than not. I will be consistently available, barring major events or, uh, you know, tragedies or family emergencies. There will be a game every other week, every week, however frequ frequently. And then the people who show up, they get the benefits of showing up. Right. And, uh, you know, also the benefits of Sandbox Campaign is that it being that it is, it, it teaches you how to actually use those tables. Um, you can, like, you do have the bandwidth as the DM to be able to run on, on a weekly or, or bi-weekly basis. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like running semi-weekly, I guess, like sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, but um, that's really more of a uh, scheduling thing personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, because we sort of like my wife also transitioned from a uh, a full time job to a part time job. So, and then I sort of lost my, <laughs> gave up my job. <laughs> um, it sort of impacted game a little bit. I had to drop one of my campaigns, uh, like put it on hold. But uh, one of my players actually had been trained on how to play that, and he picked it up and has been running on, on that that part of the uh, on the online game for me. Um, so. That's also kind of the good thing about it going to be a very open game is it sort of teaches players, it could teach players how to, how to run one on their own. Yeah. What to look for and what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very valuable thing, especially uh, something that I've noticed and, and I might, I might give copies of this to, to my players who are new because there's this idea that we, you know, we were talking about this just today in Basic Experts uh, Gilded Server. There are people who can immediately pick up the style of play and be elite from go because they don't have any bad habits. Mm -hmm. But a lot of players still need to be taught how to participate in a game that's run this way because all of the culture surrounding these things that draw people in do not encourage this kind of living campaign sandbox style play. They're, they're very much in the, the critical role camp. And when you get people who have no exposure to role playing other than watching an actual play or something like that, they, they run into some issues and they, they don't fully understand what to do there. And so a resource like this book is, is actually very helpful for onboarding those players into look, this is, this is how you should play. Yeah. Well, if you want to be part of this campaign, I, I think the important thing is to not, um, not like really sort of try to be aware of what those players are coming from yeah. and not overselling it. Like, Oh, you're gonna be able to, it's going to be everything you like you want to do and more. Um, it's going to be like, no, it's actually very different in these key ways. And like, mm -hmm. here's how, and and making sure that they're aware because it's just i mean that's just normal thing you should have a filter for your players I, you know i talk about that so yeah it's, you know I, I, like either either i send the invites or if somebody kind of petitions me i'm like there's a process that i kind of go through for making sure that they're going to be a good fit so yeah <clears throat> yeah and and the the biggest hurdle to overcome is just getting players to realize, yes, your choices matter. Now you have to make choices. Mm. Mm. I feel like that's easier for new players than the ones who've had the creativity just beaten out of them over the years. 
I I actually have a counterexample to that because my my last attempt at uh, running a campaign before this most recent one fell apart. Oh, because I told the players you have to decide what to do here. You guys have to decide where to go, what to pursue. Uh, and I will react to the choices you make. Mm-hmm. And they decided to do nothing. Oof. Literally, like at one point, someone asked me, why aren't we getting experience? To which I said, you're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. It, it, that is a hard thing to um, to sort of overcome. Like once you see that, like kind of set in. I, I've had some success with. I think I think factions do a lot, like kind of rolling to see what like factions or th- what monsters or whatever show up in the area. But uh, I, at this point, I, yeah, I don't mean to talk shop, but uh, yeah, it's um, yeah that I think that is probably that is the hardest thing. But and that's kind of the thing you want to look for in your players, I guess, if you have potential players. Yep. Well, John, once again, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it, it's been a blast talking to you, and we will we will definitely uh, bring you back on again to to do something like this again. Sure. Yeah, it was fun. I always have fun. So. Cool. Well, guys, uh, that's going to be it for the show tonight. Uh, next week, DM Blackwall will be back. Uh, we'll probably be doing something a lot like this, where we go over the news, talk about, you know, what's been happening in the, the world of role-playing games. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do some discussion on horror wars because, you know, with DM Blackwall, we got to talk about his game. We got to talk about some of the stuff that he's been doing on, on that side of things. Uh, but until then, whether you rolled a one or a 20, I'm so glad that you rolled your bones with me, Ryan Howard, and I will see you guys next time.